Afghanistan, you know, as long as I've been alive, it's kind of been a problem. It's since, ever since I was a high school student, we were always sort of dealing with these foreign wars. And after 9-11, many of us, especially people my age, were sort of, you know, kind of gung-ho. America got hit. 9-11 really put us on our heels, and we wanted to be a part of the winning team. We wanted to go back and fight for, for justice because we got hurt on that day. And what resulted was a lot of uniformity, a lot of unity, as Joe Biden likes to say in this country. And almost unanimously, the country decided that they wanted to go and invade these foreign nations, right? Iraq, Afghanistan was uh, uh, right before that. And so we've been dealing with this for a long time, oh, some like over 20 years now. And the question has always been, what do we do about this? How, do we stay there? Do we get out of there? And it felt like to me a lot of this has just been kind of kicking the can down the road until you start to maybe think that there is some method to the madness here, that maybe the idea is that the U.S. stays there indefinitely, permanently. John McCain said something like this when he was running against Barack Obama. Somebody was asking him back then in 2008. They said, hey, John, what are we going to do about Afghanistan or Iraq? And he said, well, why don't we just stay there? And like, what, you, like forever, like 20 years? He said, what, make it 50, make it 100. It doesn't matter because it, the idea was from the military industrial complex to create this base over there that would allow the U.S. to have a foothold in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. And so, you know, that was sort of the neocon belief that the United States was in the business of nation building and spreading democracy around the world so that the democracy could catch fire and then spread around and root out some of the things like terrorism and some of these other inhumane atrocities taking place all around the world. And we see it on, on a regular basis. So we've got a lot of complex issues that we need to deal with. And the question has always been, well, if we are going to pull out of there, how do we do it? And is it, is it enough time? It's been 20 years. Have we given the local population enough time to sort of create their own government, create their own security forces so that when we do leave, that we leave responsibly so that we don't leave this cratering, smoldering cauldron of death and madness. And so now we're sort of at that moment. Donald Trump, but when he was in office, was kind of the first Republican that wasn't this grand war hawk that was always talking about, you know, just bombing whomever and setting up bases in all different parts of the world. One of the first presidents that on the, on the Republican side that I saw that was really sort of shattering that same narrative. And many people came to his side and supported him on that basis. And so now he put this all in motion. And now Joe Biden is kind of picking up the ball and concluding it. Now we're sort of moving out even earlier than expected. And the question that we're having now, well, is, you know, how, what's, is this good? Is this bad? What does this look like? Should we have disengaged more smartly? And then the question is, well, we had 20 something years to do it. So why is it not prepared for our withdrawal? if you are on that side of the coin. And then we're gonna check in with Lindsey Graham and many others who are saying that no, but essentially what Joe Biden is doing here is a mistake. So we've got a lot to get to. Definitely wanna hear from you on this segment. So get those keyboards warmed up. All right, the headline here that we're gonna jump off on is back from May 25th. Okay, so we're gonna rewind the clock a little bit and go back a couple months, posted May 25th by Thomas Gibbons, Eric Schmidt, Helen Cooper over here at the New York Times says the Pentagon accelerates withdrawal from Afghanistan, says American troops are set to be out by mid-July, well ahead of President Biden's September 11th deadline. They say in the subtext here, even as big issues remain unresolved from Kabul, Afghanistan, U.S. troops and their NATO allies intend to be out of Afghanistan by early to mid-July. Well, we're a little bit behind schedule on that. Well ahead of the September 11th withdrawal deadline. Military officials said in what has turned into an accelerated ending to America's longest war, right? And many people from my generation are just tired of it. Right? We've been in this for forever and we're starting to have even more disdain for the government, like even less trust than we had back then. Back then they told us, oh, weapons of mass destruction. We're going to go in there. We're going to eliminate Osama. We're going to eliminate Saddam Hussein. We're going to then you know, create this little ecosystem where democracy will flounder and flourish, the local populations will welcome us as liberators, and the world will become a better place as a result of that. I kind of go in, drop, you know, some democracy, and then pull back out. That was how it was framed to us. Well, I was too young and naive back then to really recognize it. But looking back in hindsight, you say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, this is just what the government does. As soon as they get their little claws on a little bit of power, they're going to hold on to it for dear life. We're seeing it happen again right now with COVID, with the lockdowns, the mask mandates, the vax mandates, it's all coming around again, right? The same arguments that they made here for the pandemic, it's only two weeks to slow the spread, then we're going to get back to normal. 
No, it's never, never was that. Same with the war. Oh, we're going to go over there and solve a few things. No, it's been 20 something years. And so we're all sort of tired of it. The question always has been, is this still in America's interest to some degree? At some point, got to ask yourselves that question, right? It's okay, I guess, if you want to be this bleeding heart person that wants to go solve all the problems of the world, if you have the capacity and the bandwidth to do that, which of course is impossible. So it is an idealist dream that is unfortunately disconnected from reality. So the rest of us are trying to have this conversation. What do we do now? What's in America's best interest? The country is crumbling all over the place. We are seeing infrastructure fail throughout the, throughout the nation. Why are we losing life, liberty, and treasure over there in the form of human life, our brothers and sisters? Okay, now, but the race to the exits, says the New York Times, since Biden is now withdrawing and they're accelerating the withdrawal, which has picked up steam as plane loads of equipment and troops are flown out of the country, right? This is back in May, leaves the United States grappling with huge unresolved issues that officials had thought they would have more time to figure out. So a uh, kind of much the same pattern that we've been seeing from the Biden administration. They go in, they change a bunch of rules, and then everybody else on the back end, all of the other bureaucrats downstream from them, the people who actually have to enforce and implement their policy disasters, they are stuck holding the bag. We saw this with the border and immigration. Joe Biden came out, said, well, no, we're going to reverse that racist orange maniac's xenophobic policies and now you can come into the united states rather than remain in mexico and now we've got the uh, mayorkas just came out and said the two, over two hundred thousand in july now came across the border so again a policy change from joe biden that resulted in a catastrophe and now everybody is sort of having to clean up the mess same thing happened here with foreign policy why wouldn't it fortunately here he didn't put kamala in charge so joe biden can take ownership of this one but it's the same situation he is now saying, well, we're, I'm in office now. We're going to accelerate this, figure it out on the back end, generals. It's up to you. New York Times is even saying, yeah, huge, huge unresolved issues as they accelerate the timeline. So if you are a citizen, if you're over in Afghanistan, if you're somebody who's a security uh, component, you're over there helping to rebuild this democratic infrastructure that we've been promised for the last 20 years, you might have had a bad day today. You got, or you might still be having a bad day today because this security alert came out from the U.S. Embassy. This is official, and this is a scary little alert to get if you're somebody who thought that things were going well when you woke up. Not so good. It says the U.S. Embassy. Now, this is the location throughout Afghanistan. This is a security alert from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. It says the embassy urges U.S. citizens to leave immediately using available commercial flight options, okay, which is a problem, as we're going to see, given the fact that the Taliban has basically recaptured large swaths of the country. So uh, uh, emergency, go buy a plane ticket and get the heck out of there, and good luck. Now it says, if you cannot afford to purchase a ticket, they're going to give you some information about a loan, so you can go apply for a loan. If you are a U.S. citizen and delaying your departure while you await an immigrant visa for a spouse, give us a call. Given the security conditions and the reduced staffings, the embassy's ability to assist U.S. citizens in Afghanistan is extremely limited, even within Kabul, right, right where the embassy is. They, they send you a link. Go see what, uh, what we can do and what we can't do in a crisis. U.S. Embassy reminds citizens that on April 27th, the U.S. State Department ordered departure from the U.S. Embassy and government employees whose functions can be performed elsewhere due to increasing violence and threats. Travel advisory gave him a level four do not travel due to crime, terrorism, civil unrest, kidnapping, armed conflict, and COVID-19, of course. Domestic flights and all of those things are severely limited subject to cancellation or closure. So they recommend in paragraph one, uh, get on a plane, go find a commercial airliner and get the hell out of here. Uh, but down here in paragraph two, it's like, oh, by the way, domestic flights and ground transportations, you know, outside of Kabul are severely limited. So uh, you, 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 if you're in, you got to get out of here like right now because they are circling up and this is going to be problematic. It continues. They says just, you know, enroll in here to receive security updates and it gives you some very clear cut actions to take. Consider leaving Afghanistan via the earliest available commercial transportation. Develop a plan of action that does not rely on the U.S. government assistance. We are not here to help. Understand what the State Department can do and cannot do. Enroll in this program to get some new security updates. And if your passport expired, well, you, could, you still got to renew your passport before you leave. So it's uh, not much love there. Uh, hey, they're like, hey, we told you. April 27th, we told you it was coming. You know, we're going to throw everybody else out, out, 
<laughs> we're going to throw all property owners out of their homes and, and sort of seize their property for other people. Uh, but in this case, uh, no, no love for you, right? You're on your own people, get out of your houses, uh, get out, get out of there, find a, an airliner. If you, if you have financial problems, you can go apply for a loan. If you have any questions about it, I'm going to refer you to this FAQ, what the state department can and can't do. Good luck. All right. So, well, you know, maybe you're saying to yourself, I guess that's their problem for being in Afghanistan. I guess that's one way to look at it. But uh, sounds like they're just sort of uh, abandoning ship to some degree. And uh, I want to show you what's going on now. So you might, you know, if, if you're that person, if you're that citizen who's waking up going, oh, wait, honey, we just got this uh, memo from the U.S. Embassy. They said they can't protect us anymore. They sort of uh, said that they could and now they can't. So we better go. Well, should we book a flight? Well, there aren't any because the, uh, the Taliban is surrounding the entire city so uh, or, or working their way closer to that so let's take a look here i've got some footage this was posted over on twitter says that kandahar in complete conquest so you can see this was translated says the Muja mujahideen reached the martyrs square praise be to allah so i'm going to just show you this it is uh it's not violent there's there are some firearms in it but uh, very briefly i just wanted you to listen to the sound you can hear what's going on in this city which is uh, apparently uh, in Kandahar. So this is what it sounds like. A lot of, uh, of sounds of war going on. So if you, you are sensitive to that, of course, be advised. <laughs> All right, so you can just hear kind of the noises, the sound of, you know, the, 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 the bombs, the gunshots, whatever's happening there. There's a lot of activity, and we're going to show a map here in a second of sort of the surrounding areas as allegedly the Taliban forces are encroaching near and, and sort of, you know, coming upon the Kabul embassy. So uh, a couple clips here. Before we do that, uh, some updates now. So you just heard what is happening. So today... The Pentagon said, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty bad. It's going to be a disaster. So they decided today to send the 3,000 troops back to Afghanistan. So pull them out, send them back. Now they're going back to evacuate Americans and won't say whether the U.S. will stay past August 31st. So the deadline is now sort of, sort of being reversed, isn't it? The State Department announces the Kabul embassy drawdown as Taliban captures 12 cities. All right, so they're just uh, surging on through. Pentagon is sending troops back into Afghanistan to help evacuate some U.S. personnel. Diplomats are weighing how soon they could have to totally evacuate the U.S. Embassy, where some 4,000 people are employed. That's a big operation, right? Get on an airplane. Good luck. State Department last week warned U.S. citizens to get out of the war-ravaged nation immediately, which is good. Taliban now seized control of 12 provincial capitals, two-thirds of the nation. Taliban fighters are going door to door and forcing young women in captured areas into sex slavery. And they're executing Afghan forces who surrender. So uh, we're, we're, it's sort of deja vu, right? Remember when all this was going on in Iraq and we had ISIS and all of that, the beheadings, the rapes, the tortures, the drowning people alive, the burning people alive, all of that stuff, right? So we're probably in for another round of that, which of course is always very, very good. So it kind of you know, it scares the hell out of everybody back home. Everybody goes, oh, we're about to be uh, taken over by terrorism again. And so then that suddenly justifies, I don't know, another 20 years of war or something so, uh, because of that. So we're getting ready to go back through that cycle again, just like we're in season two of pandemic and it's just the worst season ever. Uh, it's going to be uh, probably another round two of this again. So we'll see if, how season two is of uh, the Middle Eastern War. It's probably like season 2022 now. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Now here is uh, U.S. military brass coming out and telling us uh, what this is going to look like what the 3,000 troops going back looks like. And so they're going to tell us, uh, well, you know, it's, it's really complicated military terms. I never served in the armed services, so it's, it's complicated for, for somebody like me to understand what he's saying. But he's talking about, you know, a short term. Well, you can listen in and tell me what you think. Uh, as you know, and uh, I'm sure you heard from my colleague over at the State Department, uh, the president has ordered the reduction of civilian personnel uh, uh, at our embassy in Kabul. Uh, and the acceleration of the evacuation of Afghan special immigrant visa applicants from the country. Uh, to enable this safe, orderly reduction, 
The Secretary of Defense has directed the department to position temporary enabling capabilities there it is. to ensure the safety and security of U.S. and partner civilian personnel. I'm going to break this down for you uh, just real quick. The All right, so movement. the first thing we'll pause on is the temporary enabling capabilities, right? You love these little these little phrases that these bureaucrats come up with. It's like, are you sending troops back or not? Are you sending multiple battalions to go back in there and uh, take care of business? Yeah, yes or no? You're going to call it these these multiple you know, or what were these uh, you know kind of these temporary you know, whatever facilities, just like we see on the border, these emergency pop up sites all over the place, and so it's still 3,000 troops. Now, as he explains what that is, what that is supposed to be, you're going to see we got a lot of we have a lot of personnel going back over there. Here he continues. Will consist of three infantry battalions that are currently in the Central Command Area of Responsibility. They will move to Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul within the next 24 to 48 hours. Two of those battalions are United States Marines and one is a U.S. Army battalion. The next movement will consist of a joint U.S. Army Air Force support element of around 1,000 personnel wow. to facilitate the processing of SIV applicants. Initial elements of this uh, movement, of this element, uh, will arrive in Qatar in the coming days. The third movement is to alert and to deploy one infantry brigade combat team out of Fort Bragg to Kuwait, where they will be postured and prepared if needed to provide additional security at the airport. We anticipate those forces will reach Kuwait sometime within the next week. Now, I want to stress that these forces are being deployed to support the orderly and safe reduction of civilian uh. personnel at the request of the State Department and to help facilitate an accelerated process of, of uh, working through SIV applicants. This is a temporary mission oh, there it is. with a narrow focus. All right. Well, we'll see. Temporary narrow focus. We'll see. You saw it's basically five or three different movements with five different battalion. Marines are going, armies going, infantry's going. We've got little bases being set up in case they need support. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be short and narrow. And we'll see. We'll see if they're out by August 31st. We'll uh as with all deployments. We'll see. All right. So that was from the military. Let's see uh, what Jen Psaki had to say. So people are already asking her about this. She's in the White House today. And a gentleman was asking her about this. You know, we got some uh, questions about Afghanistan. Here is how she handled it. The president promised that the United States would continue to provide civilian and um, humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan. Um, but if the Taliban were to take over the government again, won't those individuals um, be withdrawn? Well, first, I would say that we have every intention of continuing an ongoing president present in Kabul, um, which is continuing <laughs> even after we bring our uh, military uh, who, who are serving uh, home by the end of August. OK, uh, but we will also continue to be partners to the Afghan government. That's something that uh, the president reiterated when he met with leaders just a week and a half ago that we that includes security assistance, that includes humanitarian assistance, uh, and that includes over the horizon uh, capacity. Uh, to ensure that we are uh, working to address any threats that we face. Uh, that will continue, and we intend to have a presence on the ground uh, in our embassy there in Kabul. It does seem like the Taliban is starting to gain more power and take over there. Yeah. What's the United States government, what's President Biden willing to do um, after pulling troops out? Well, I would first say if you take us back to when the president made this decision and announcement, um, we uh, he asked his team to do a clear-eyed assessment, not to sugarcoat it, okay. of what the impact could be of uh, moving, uh, withdrawing our troops from Afghanistan. After a 20-year war, a war that the president continues to feel uh, does not have a military solution. What the president is continuing to press on is a political solution and political negotiations and discussions, which we hope will reconvene soon to move toward a political solution on the ground to bring greater peace and stability to the people of Afghanistan. OK, so all right. So, you know, there's a lot there. So first and foremost, I'm very glad that she is telling us that she they have every intention of having a continuing president. That's good because many of us have a lot of questions about that. Not so sure that I agree with her on that. But the rest of the point here was that, yeah, a, a ongoing continuing presence doesn't don't, don't know what that means. You know, it, this could be, you know, the the apparatus that, sh that was just described by the military they're sending them back in there and we've got this sort of you know it's not the military now it's not our we already did our withdrawal but now it's just a, an ongoing presence right so we've seen this all the time in the, out of the government they just change the labels and it's this perpetual you know uh, I think Janet Napolitano did this you know it's not 
it's not the war on terrorism. It's a, uh, you know, unexpected human tragedies or something like that. They changed the language, but it's the same thing. So we'll see what, what goes on there. But, you know, Jen Psaki is sort of doubling down on it, says Joe Biden. Yeah, this is what he said. He said that this is not a winnable war militarily, which you might agree with that. You might actually say, yeah, you're right. We've been there for 20 years. This is an insurgency, the likes of which probably is never going to be eradicated. It's sort of, you know, woven into the culture over there. And this, this, you know, the, the idea that the United States is gaining anything by continuing this perpetual presence there is, is maybe slowly fading in, in terms of popularity with the American people. But she then pivots which I, you might even agree with her on that one. But then she then pivots and then says, well, we're just going to have to deal with this uh, politically. We're going to see what we can do politically with the Taliban, which we've all seen what many of these organizations do, right? If the Taliban starts to engage in the same sort of atrocities that we saw ISIS do, is there any belief that they're going to be a reasonable diplomatic political entity there? Probably not. And so it sounds like a little bit of sugarcoating. If the Biden agenda, if their intention is that we're just going to get out of there and whatever happens, happens, right? That's at least a little bit more intellectually honest. You might disagree with that from a moral standpoint, but the idea that they're going to sell this thing to us as it's just a political solution, uh, I think that it, that leaves a little bit to be desired. That being said, there's really no else, no, no other way to frame it. All right. And so that was Jen Psaki. Let's see what else we have. I think we have a map. Yep. Here's the map now of what the actual infrastructure looks like over there. So you'll notice April 2021, this was an article. I think this was an AP article. Yeah, AP took this picture. You can see Kabul is here. And you'll notice that in green, this is government controlled counties or you know sectors or whatever so a lot of green we have a lot of green here in the middle of the country and then all of these light sort of tan colors are contested areas so the government it, you know the afghani forces are making stands in these different sectors and then we have taliban control which are here going to be in the orange and so unknown are going to be in the grays and you can just see what it looks like right it's kind of one of those uh, color tests like can you see the, the number six in there kind of hard a lot of different colors all you know all over the place the country is is in in a war we've got different pockets where there's control and contest taking place all throughout the country so then we fast forward just a couple months go by and now this is what it looks like so we can see the taliban here in august they've overrun many of the provincial capitals we can see that uh kabul was over here and it is still sort of in that same area right being slowly surrounded by Taliban forces, as you can see, the, the the country just slowly falls under their control. And so, okay, right, this is the compare and contrast. Maps show districts where the Taliban are predominantly in control. Data compiled by the Long War Journal, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, Washington-based research institute. Data cannot be verified independently in all cases, but in line with reporting from the AP. So, you know, that that is happening. And you know, I always thought that Mike Huckabee actually gave a pretty good answer on this stuff back when he was running for for president. I, I forget when that was, maybe back in 2008, but, you know, said something to the effect that the U.S. went in there and sort of broke it, right? If you go in and you break something, you're responsible for fixing something. And uh, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't look so good. Now, you can, again, have a lot of differing opinions on this. Here is a picture from the scene on the ground. Taliban militants are seen inside the city, 150 kilometers away from the national capital of Kabul. And you've got this guy here with, you know, a bazooka, RPG, whatever that is. And so, you know, you take a look at that where you've got armed soldiers, you've got a civil war, you've got a lot of death and destruction, and it's easy to jump on the bandwagon with Lindsey Graham. He says all of this is the result of President Biden, believing he knows more than his military advisors, apparently learned nothing from Iraq. When it comes to Afghanistan, the worst is yet to come. And so, you know, there are many people who, who, who totally agree with that. They look at photos like this and they say, this is horrendous. This is an awful situation. We've got children's are forced to flee their homes due to fighting in Afghanistan. They drink tea sit in a refugee camp. Here's another one. Families rest in a camp in Kabul after they fled their homes due to the fear of the Taliban and sought shelter in government areas. Well, actually, those look nicer than some of the, the uh, refugee immigration migrant camps that our own government is uh, giving to some of the southern border migrants here in the United States. Uh, but so you can look at those things and say that's, yeah, right? The United States has a moral obligation to go around the world and help root out atrocities wherever they're happening. 
And so many, many people believe that. And many other people take a look at a statement like Lindsey Graham and they say, well, listen, Byla, you have been in power for the last I don't know, 30 years. And so your side has been in Afghanistan. You have been in Iraq. And a lot of these same problems are still you know, manifesting themselves. And more, more specifically, what does that benefit the United States of America for? Why is the United States government funding all of this? Why are the United States people losing their loved ones and spending their dollars to rebuild other countries when we've got crumbling infrastructure all around our own country, where California has fires ra raging every summer, different states have a difficult time keeping the stinking electricity on in many parts of this country. Water is bad. Roads are falling apart. We have morons in Congress who pass a $1.2 trillion spending bill, uh, infrastructure bill. Nobody knows where the money's going. Probably not going to fix most of those things. So, you know, we, we, we look at that and we start to ask ourselves as Americans, what are we doing? What we were promised there was a short little stint of America's security, American security. And that never happened. We've lost many lives, spent trillions of dollars over there. And it doesn't look like the people are accepting of this new vision for democracy in their lives. And so at what point does the U.S. continue to spend our blood, sweat, and toil, our, our treasure over there? Lindsey Graham would probably say forever, as, 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 whatever it takes, right? As long as it takes, as long as the, 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 the battle continues. Uh, and now, so... Final, final point here from Jen Psaki. She says, uh, the Taliban also has to make an assessment about what they want their role to be in the international community. So here's Jen Psaki here. A very short clip, and we'll jump right into the chat. The Taliban also has to make an assessment about what they want their role to be in the international community. The All right, so let's jump into the super chats. Let's jump into the watching the watchers locals chats and see what you have to say about this. It's a complicated topic. I totally understand that. So we're probably going to have some differing opinions, but that's what's just so dang fun about the show. All right, our first one here from I'm Not Gas says, I'm no Biden fan, but I will not criticize him for this. I don't care what the Pentagon sponsored talking heads say on the news. There was no right way to leave, no matter what it would be messy. This outcome would have been, would have happened if we stayed there one more year or 100 more years. I voted for Obama for his promises to bring our troops home. I voted for Trump for his promises to bring our troops home. I'll even give Biden a win for actually keeping this going. We spent trillions propping up a corrupt government full of drug dealers and child molesters so they can fight the Taliban, a the theocratic band of extremists who kill girls for going to school. Our military presence can't fix their culture. We were extremely naive and arrogant to think that we could. So that's a good comment there. I'm not gas. I think I agree with a lot of what you said there. And uh, <laughs> so I, I like the passion there, right? We're, we're, I think I'm kind of in your boat. We're all kind of tired of it. All right. We got Angie says a bit off topic, but what are your thoughts on the Julian Assange trial? I haven't been following it too much, but I know that there's a big extradition battle that is taking place. Maybe we'll cover that on the next segment. Okay. So those, th those were another those were Prince Andrew. So just a quick reminder to kind of, if you ask a question ahead of the show, I may not get to it. So you may want to just save those questions and resubmit them uh, when we're on that segment. All right, we have this, I'm, uh, another one. I'm not gas. I do like this issue for exposing partisan hacks. You can see people take 180 degree stances on this issue now that it's Biden in office, either praising him or hating him for it. And you can see now who on the out and out, who the warmongers are, who have said pulling out of Afghanistan is too soon under Trump and now under Biden. Yeah. Right. You, you can. It can sort of break that. Right. Donald Trump was one of the first Republicans who was you know, sort of anti-war. Right. Kind of from the very beginning and was always ripping on, you know, Iraq and all of that stuff. And you can debate that. Right. He has clips where he's playing both sides of the fence there. But yeah. I, right. Easily. And it is funny. And it is it is kind of a, a Trump. Right. Trump kind of started it. So people who are criticizing him, him on that. I think are criticizing him on the mechanism, right? By the, on the way he accelerated it and the whole thing. And so you can have qualms about both, I think. We have want to know says, military worried about suicides for those that served there. Well, that's terrible. Yeah, I think that our, our, our uh, armed services often get, get overlooked in that area, mental health for sure. Donald Trump says, I have a big ego. But I'm, pr uh, but I'm not as petty as Joe Biden wanting to withdraw on 9-11, which is, a, yeah, it was a weird thing. America spent 20 years in Afghanistan, yet as soon as we withdraw, it starts to collapse. Then Afghanistan is going to collapse like Libya with open slavery. Biden wants to send troops back to Afghanistan because he wants the money from the military industrial complex. Horrible for America. Yeah, kind of, you know, perpetual war. It's very good for business. And if we don't have foreign, you know, affairs, 
Oh, they're just going to turn it inland now. They're just uh, instead of foreign terrorism, international terrorism. What do we have? Domestic terrorism, which is what Nancy Pelosi continues to call it. Oh, Lorenzo Greasy Bottoms says that. <laughs> I can't read that, uh, Lorenzo. Lorenzo wants you know wants to get aggressive with with some military might. Sergeant Bob says the bottom line is that people in the Middle East countries know full well they cannot again trust the USA. Yeah, once trust is lost, so is any potential for having influence. I wonder who is running all this. Doubtful that it is Sleepy Joe, although ultimately he owns it. Yeah, right. He is going to own it, and and there's there's a lot to that. There's a lot to the idea that. Well, you know, the person who pulls out of it, whatever the consequences are, they're going to have to deal with that. And, and you know, the follow-up question to that would be, how would Donald Trump have pulled out? Would it have been different? Would the consequences have been the same? I don't know. Maybe. Want to know says, let's just leave all the Afghanistan uh, refugees too. They're going to be killed and court, uh, tortured. And it's just going to be bad. Yeah, so just, just... I get your point. Peely Wally says the U.S. and the U.K. should never have went into Afghanistan or Iraq. Just because we have democracies that work doesn't mean all countries can operate the same way. Some countries need to be and do operate better under other hardline leaders, just like China. We should stay out of the other country's troubles and mind our own business. It is less costly and safer for our citizens moving forward that way. I, Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. We should mind our own business. And the federal government should mind their own business as well. We have Sergeant Bob says, do we see another Benghazi? Maybe Hillary should be brought back as a consultant. Yeah, because she did such a good job there. Good to see you, Sergeant. Hunter Biden is here, says, did somebody say sex sex slaves? There's a, there's a wild Hunter Biden story going around here. I'm going to look at it uh, and see if we can talk about it on this channel, but it is so, so bad. I'm not sure. We have Robute says, if Afghanistan starts to collapse as soon as U.S. troops leave, it really indicates that the central government is weak and incompetent. Considering the government is weak and easily loses to Afghanistan with the Taliban using captured tanks and equipment, leading to Afghanistan collapsing, then being there is such a waste of time. Also, 3,000 troops, even enough to stop the collapse or even the evacuation. This is such a train wreck. That's, that's I think, the biggest critique here is that the whole thing just feels like, man, it's just like a, like a, it is a train wreck. Pull everybody out. Do it quickly. Everybody sounds the alarms. Send them back in just to remove the embassy. Like you couldn't even secure the embassy before you left ridiculous all right ronald reagan is here says there is nothing more permanent than a temporary government program uh i know miss miss the old gipper all right let's jump over to some super chats so i make sure i don't miss any of those we've got dr sammy d says those who helped the u.s government in afghanistan were greedy war profiteers who aided and abetted the u.s government no sympathy from me yeah, there's a lot of that. Of course, war is uh, ripe for corruption and bribery and all sorts of nefarious deeds. And we've seen that throughout all of history. Why would we think it's any different now? We have Alex Bogey says, before deploying to Afghanistan five years ago, I was briefed that the war was lost. So this was inevitable. I think Trump shrewdly pulled the troops out after the election so that Biden will get blamed. Yeah, right. Hang it on. Hang it on. Maybe some strategery to that, but it is also a sad thing that that's how you were briefed and that that's what we're doing. It's yeah. OK, we ha thanks for sharing that. Eddie Oliver is here, says, Rob, were you aware the Taliban has already started beheading Afghani translators? Everything Biden does is a complete disaster. It's like he doesn't even think it through before he does something because it's about the feelings and about w the policy wins back home. Right. The 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 traditional American voter are not as plugged into these issues as you and I are. We spend our time talking about these things because it's important to us and it should be important to more people. Maybe we would see more competent leadership if more people were engaged in the process. But the government has just said, no, we'll take care of everything for you. So you don't need to think anymore. That way we can just do whatever the hell we want and nobody's going to have any oversight over us. So in this situation, Joe Biden just does what he does, just goes and makes some quick changes and it's going to be a nice policy win. We're not going to be racist anymore in this country at the border. So we're going to make some policy changes that causes more harm to the migrants than under Trump. Same thing will probably happen here, right? We're going to pull out immediately. Sir, we got some, you know, maybe we should think about evacuating the embassy first. Well, I don't care. I can't remember what I said yesterday anyways. So just get it done. All right. And now they're sending troops back. It really looks incompetent. And it's, it's, it's kind of on pattern with the rest of the activity we see from the administration in general. They also have changed, you know, mass guidance and uh, 
all of the data from you know the CDC kind of ebbs and flows on any particular day. So it's just kind of a dynamic administration. Sometimes we're going to do this. Sometimes we're going to do that. And the whole thing is just going to be a disaster. We have another one from Eddie who said, Rob, I'm a vet who served during Desert Storm. Yeah, this withdrawal could have been better. Exclamation point. It was a top down decision with no input from their subordinates, which sounds about right. Right. It's it's the policy at the top. And the S rolls downhill, as we know. Thank you very much for those super chats. And Eddie Oliver, I appreciate all of that. Jumping back over to locals. Let's see what else we've got. Uh, Dewey Sniffum says, if I... <laughs> no, I can't read that. I can't read that. So, uh, Genghis Khan says, it's nearly impossible to conquer Afghanistan and occupy it for any significant amount of time. I conquered Afghanistan, but it took a long time involving raising cities to the ground, wanton slaughter and genocide, <laughs> as well as scorched earth tactics. So the Afghanistan would not be able to hold unless they engage the same tactics as I did. Well, there you go, folks. That's Genghis Khan chiming in and giving us some good, good, you know, ancient military advice about Afghanistan being difficult. Thank you for that, Genghis. Very, very appreciative. Kenny 1B says, not only is Biden losing Afghanistan, but he's letting China ramp up offensive nuclear capabilities, ignoring Russia's continued aggression, including taunting large quantities of tactical nuclear weapons, all while cutting the U.S. budget of the military, decimating the use of the nuclear enterprise, also cutting oil production, and then going and begging OPEC to bring that back up. So it's just... God, it's kind of a disaster. Uh, it's just awful. We have another one here from Petty Biden. Uh-oh, Petty Biden's here. Says the Afghan warlords, which gave the Taliban the power, were pissed off after America became perfidious and broke their promise. This resulted in Afghan warlords supporting the Taliban, which enabled them to conquer Afghanistan. Note, the Taliban were reasonable when Donald Trump was in office, engaged in diplomatic negotiations. It's just Joe Biden was petty and wrecked the deal. That's from Petty Biden. Yeah, there's 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 some of that going on too. Gail is here, says, when will we ever learn that the USA cannot fix the Middle East? Maybe we'll learn after this time. Probably not. Greg Morat says the Taliban always wanted to create an Islamic state between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The Taliban in the in Pakistan is actually much stronger than Afghanistan. They were funded by Saudi to wedge a block against Iran from the east. All this can be chalked up to a thousand year old conflict between the Sunnis and the Shias. If you are on the side of the Saudis, this is not necessarily something bad. Would that benefit the U.S. as a Saudi? is a U.S. ally and Iran is not. That's from Greg Morat. So, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be an, an expert on Middle Eastern international diplomacy and all of that conflict. I think that, the, you know, the real question, at least in my generation and many people on my side of this equation are saying, what is in it for the United States? I know it's selfish and I know that that's a horrendous thing to say, but what are we getting out of it? We've been over there for 20 something years and I understand the idea that, you know, a, a, a more democratic world is better for the world, but that requires some enrollment from the people who are in the, in that geographical region. If they have no interest in it, then what are we there? And if they can, art look, if they came out and said for oil, Rob, Rob, it's for oil. We need oil. We don't have enough oil. We're there for the oil. We need it. Sorry. Okay. Well, at least that's a reason. All right. Next up, we've got from Wide Awake says, help me out. I was five when 9-11 happened. I can remember it on the news like I was five. What do the terrorists even want? What is the end game for all of that terrorism? I don't know. You know, I think it is about a perpetual war, right? There are just some, some cultures and societies that just have to go and fight a war, right? That's sort of the purpose of living. It, the purpose of living is to go and fight for the cause and then die for the cause, right? That's the whole purpose of living. So once you're in that culture and a death in the name of your ideology is cherished and treasured, well, you, you sort of get this culture where that is rewarded and encouraged and perpetuated. Other than that, I don't know. Do they want their own geographic region? Probably not. I think they just want power and bloodshed. That's just how some people live in the world. We have another one here. It says, a rigorous nuclear deterrent prevents the need from U.S. troops occupying hostile lands. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. We have another one from Arnie B5. It says, President Trump sent a press release concerning the withdrawal. Non-YouTube-friendly statement. Let's see here. He says, if I were president, the world would find that our withdrawal from Afghanistan would be a conditions-based withdrawal. I had discussions with top Taliban leaders whereby they understood what they were doing now would not have been acceptable. 
would not have been much different and much more successful withdrawal. And the Taliban understood that better than anyone. What is going on now is not acceptable. It should have been done much better. Yeah, I think that's a pre I think that's a pretty I think that's okay. If I I think that's an okay statement. So I read that. Thank you for that. That was from Arnie B5. I think that's okay. Uh, YouTube gets a little bit squirrely when he talks about uh, you know makes allegations about the last election. That's when they really get upset about it. But yeah, right. That's kind of the point that I think a, a lot of people are are mentioning. It, yeah, it could have been better. We have Lorenzo Greasy Bottom says YouTube friendly versions. <laughs> okay. I still can't read that, Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo is is advocating for, let's say, a lot of uh, fury militarily and fireballs in uh, uh, that area. Okay, we have uh, It's Ed says, hey, Rob, love you, buddy. Unfortunately, you are incorrect about something. It's only in the last 20 years that Republicans became war happy. Prior to that, we didn't want war. Check the history. It was the Dems that wanted war, even under Clinton. Once Bush Jr. wanted to go to war, total rhino, the ideology turned. I'm never for American blood being shed on foreign soil. I hate the idea of war crimes that happens there, but that is a cultural thing that you have to change. We can never change that. Unless it would be a worldwide effort, not an American effort, nothing will ever change. It's heartbreaking, but nothing much we can do until you change the culture. Yeah, thanks for that, Ed. You know, and I and I, I'm sure that's accurate, right? I I don't have anything to say to contest that. I I I you know, I I this is a very it feels like a very calloused thing to say, right? That the United States cannot be the bucket for all of the burdens of the world. There's just not enough capacity to do that. And so you feel that every time that you, you, you look at these people who want to come across the southern border and come into the United States, and it just breaks your stinking heart. And you want to figure out a way that you can help them, right? And so the United States wants to, wants to be a good nation. I think that's what we want to do. But there are some efforts where our ROI, our return on our investment is not good. And the Middle East has been one of those areas. What else could we do to improve the world if we didn't spend the last 20 years just kind of working towards a lost cause? Maybe we could have done more to help the world if we weren't so bogged down there. Uh, thank you for the context there. It's Ed. I appreciate that. We have Lauren S. says, whatever happened to minding our own business? Well, I don't know. You know, that, that happened internationally. That went away out the window internationally a long time ago. And now we don't even have it domestically. Can't even mind our own business now. We have Soul Viking says the U.S. can cr take credit for the fall of Libya and the devastating after effects. Heart goes out to the innocent Afghani people for what has happened and what is to come. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, it is heartbreaking, man. They're, they're people. They're human beings over there. And so it's, it's not, you know, as easy. Well, we've been over there for 20 years. Good luck. Well, we were over there, right? We, we, you know, those people, some of those people in those pictures, they were born when the United States was there. And they were relying on the United States to provide some security. And now the United States is not there anymore. And they're like, what? Our whole lives. I'm 16 years old. My whole life you've been here. And now you're gone. And my mom and I are just sitting here. And we've got the Taliban who are going to come in here, kill me and rape her. Okay, great. Thanks, United States. And so that's why you know, every time there's intervention, like it's, the, the government causes so many problems and unintended consequences. They break things that they can never fix. And then... The world suffers as a result, and it just angers the hell out of me. All right, next up, we've got Sergeant Bob says, the end game for terrorism is to possess the podium. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, so I forgot. Yeah, silly me. It's it's obvious, right? They, they want to capture the podium, the speaker's podium of the House of Representatives, the one that the insurrectionist almost got. Almost lost America on January 6th, folks. Thank, thankfully, we're here. Uh, Bin Laden is dead, another one says. Let's extract those local who aided the U.S. military and welcome them to our country. Uh, we got a few more here. Says, uh, do, not, do, not, do not read this. Okay, that was from Arnie. Uh, yes, okay, you're right. <laughs> yeah, so I can't read that. So Arnie gave me the full context of the full Trump quote. And he gave the statement that I said YouTube has a problem with. So that's why you're right. I would not have read that one, RDB5. It's hilarious. He can't really post a comment or post something without <laughs> saying that line. So almost everything he posts, well, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Uh, uh, it's just hysterical. All right. So those were great questions. A couple more super chats I saw come in. 
We have one here from Eddie Oliver. Nope, I already got that one, Eddie. And I got another chat over here from Eddie. Uh, this one from Texas says, everybody knew this was going to happen. The government was weak. They thought they could use special ops and mercenary, but it collapsed faster. <laughs> we have, uh, first of all, I, I, yeah, I don't, I'll take your word for it. I mean, I, it sounds like, you know, these decisions are sort of made hastily and then they sort of create the framework on the back end. It's like you set a goal and you oh, I'll figure out how to do it later. Doesn't work like that when you're trying to remove 4,000 employees from an embassy and you tell them just get a, get a, a, a get a U.S. Airlines flight. Get out of here. All right. Eddie Oliver chatted, said Osama bin Laden was upset with the U.S. occupation of the Middle East. That's why 9-11 happened. Right. And you hear that that a lot. A lot of people say, well, maybe if the U.S. wasn't so meddlesome in everybody else's business, that maybe they wouldn't, you know, have such a problem with another foreign country occupying your land for the last 20 years. Right. I'd be pretty angry about that myself if somebody came into my hometown and did the same thing. But. We have different cultures, don't we? We have different lives, different economics. We have different liberties, different freedoms, different human values, and, and a lot there. So it's more complicated than just that. All right, those were great questions. Thank you for all of those. And I love the super chats. Awesome questions over from locals. Shout out to the chats over there. Let's see what's going on. We've got Jack Elias now in the house. Sweet Poe, Tay Toe, Thunder 7. We got Farmer's Daughter signed up, joined in. I see her in there. Wide Awake 95, three girlies. Over on YouTube, we've got a straight and narrow. We got K-Bean, Molly Jonti. We got Vijaya. We have Curtis Bartle and Zorro and many others. I really do appreciate all of the questions on that segment. Very good discussion. Look forward to some more on the next one. Thanks so much for watching. Before you head out, I want to just remind you that I am a criminal defense lawyer here in Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, we've got a long history of helping good people facing criminal charges to find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and beyond that in their lives. Our phone number for a free case evaluation is 480-787-0394. You can also find us online at www.rrlawaz.com. We can help with any type of criminal charge in the state of Arizona, things like DUI, drug offenses, misdemeanor offenses. And we can also help with clearing up old case records like expunging cases or making sure that you can restore your rights so that you can vote again or possess a firearm again or apply for some other federal benefits. We can remove mug shots off the internet. Basically, any time that you or somebody you know or love is in trouble with the law in the state of Arizona, we have an amazing team of people. We would just love the opportunity to help. And our phone number, of course, 480-787-0393. Nine, four. And if you don't need any legal services, that's a very good thing, but you may be interested in some informational offerings so that you are prepared if you do have to deal with the police. And of course, I want to invite you to head on over to gumroad.com slash Robert Gruller. You'll notice here, I've got several different trainings that are available, including the law enforcement interaction training. This is the one, two, three rule for dealing with the police. It's one rule you need, two questions that the police can ask of you, and three responses if they ask you a problematic question. So that's available now. You can also get a load up my personal productivity system here called Existence Systems. Fun little course. And then we have here, if you're a lawyer or a legal professional, be sure to check out this program. We are meeting twice every month. Again, all of this over at Gumroad dot com slash Robert Gruller. And if none of that sounds any good to you, well, just go ahead and, and give us a follow because I'm working on some other products and some other offerings. And of course, if you have not already done so, want to invite you one more time to head on over to watching the watchers dot locals dot com. It's where you can support the show and it's where we can connect. We've got monthly Zoom meetings and a lot of other goodies coming up. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your love and support. I will see you on the next one.